All right, rhythms. So we've been talking about rhythms and how to manage my life in 2024. Uh, what are rhythms? They're habits. They're things that we use to combat a lot of the things uh, that come at us. There's a lot of situations in life that we don't necessarily plan for, but yet there are habits that God has given us to help us deal with them. And so uh, I'm making the same disclosure as I did the last two weeks. Uh, I'm not a counselor. Uh, I'm, I, I didn't get my degree in counseling, uh, but I did get my degree in Bible. And so I'm going to tell you what the Bible says about this. Now, as far as counseling is concerned, I've been to counseling. I believe in counseling. Please, there are great tools out there in counseling. But I also think that God has a lot to say about the things that we deal with in life and, some, and how to manage our lives. And so today we're going to be talking about how to manage our thoughts, our thoughts. This is probably at the core of a lot of our issues. A lot of our battles go on up here. And so we're going to be talking about how to manage those thoughts. How do I, how do I manage the things that come at me in my own mind? And, um, and this led me to, to think about uh, when me and Bria first got married. You see, um, I don't know if, uh, if you've um, been in a long-term relationship or if you're married, but le let me just give you an insight of what happens. Sometimes, you, for some reason, we believe certain lies and presuppositions about the other person or about relationships. And for me specifically, I thought, man, if we fight, our relationship is over. Like the first time we have conflict, I, I, gotta, I gotta relieve any conflict that ever happens. And, and so I always had to make sure that, you know, I was tippy-toeing and making sure everything was good, wanted to keep my, my wife happy. They say, happy wife, happy life. I tried to believe that as much as I could. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just not gonna have any conflict. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was tough. Uh, so for the first six months of our relationship, every time I'm like, you know, I, I, I'd get frustrated with something, but I'd be like, it's okay, it's okay. No, 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 you know what? You're right, I'm wrong. Let's do it that way. Um, and so we just kept doing that and kept doing that. So some people in the room are like, yeah, that's the right way to do it, man. Uh, no, no, no. So I kept, I kept doing that. I kept like, okay, cool. And I noticed she was doing that. We were just avoiding this thing, this, a, a fight brewing until about six months later. And I'd like to tell you it was like the biggest deal on the planet. No, it was the most minor thing we could ever fight about. But we blew up and like, there was this bag that we had just stacked of issues and issues and issues. And then there was a table, which was called the fight. And that's where we just dumped the entire bag that we both had. And we just started going at it. Like, I think we forgot about what the original issue was at first. But I kid you not, it felt so good. <laughs> like, it, no, like the actual fight was horrible, but like just being able to be honest and throw things out there and just put things on the table. Like we found resolutions for things we had never even th thought about. We had figured out solutions for a lot of things. We had opened up a lot of conversation. And yet for the entire time, there was a lie in my head that said, the minute we get to this point, it's over. Like our marriage is gonna fail. Like, it, no, 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 I can't do that. And yet the truth was, that actually it was an opportunity for us to honestly figure out a lot of our lifestyle habits, a lot of our insecurities, a lot of the things in marriage that, you know, we, we kind of hide. And we finally put it on the table. And it was interesting because I thought about it. I'm like, man, had I just known that prior, had I, been, had I known the truth beforehand, those six months wouldn't have been as miserable as they were. <laughs> Um, but this is what we do a lot of the time. You see, uh, in, in our minds, our thoughts, the things that we tell ourselves are either the greatest assets that we have and the center for the greatest creativity that could even exist, or also the place where our greatest insecurities and fears get the better of us. This is where they lie. Uh, a, a president um, back in the day named Ronald Reagan said this. He said, uh, there, there are no constraints on the human mind, no walls around the human spirit, no barriers to our progress except those we ourselves erect. The worst things that happen go on up here. You see, what kind of, we, we have a lot of barriers that we usually face. And typical barriers that we face, that we create in our minds, typical walls that we create, 
are things like, I'm going to fail, and I know it. Or I have failed, therefore I will. I'm not enough. I can't do this. I'm, I, don't, I'm, I don't feel equipped, nor do I have the capabilities or the talents or the gifts for this. Or I'm undeserving. I've done too much. I don't deserve this. And you see, typically what happens is when we allow these thoughts to come into our mind and really get the better of us and, and, and make us make choices based on them, we usually lead to what a lot of people call the five C's of negative thinking. The first one is complaining. We start complaining. Now, this isn't just typical complaining because, I mean, don't look at your neighbor and say, oh, you complain a lot. You might be negative thinking. No, it's nothing like that. It's, it's more just getting stuck in a loop of problems without solutions. You ever get stuck in those moments where you're just like, you're complaining about everything, but you've got so solutions for nothing? Okay, maybe you know somebody that has done that and you're like, think of a solution, man. The other one is uh, criticizing. We just start criticizing. This one is done with an intention to tear something down rather than improve it. So th that's how you can pinpoint the fact that you're negative thinking, it, that you're negatively thinking, is the fact that we're criticizing just to tear something down, not because we want to see it get better. The other one is concern. This is a good thing typically, but when we overdo it, it gravitates us toward worry and overthinking. Another one is commiserating. This one's repetitive and, and be, uh, re, uh, it's repeating and being stuck in a mindset of only sharing problems. There's only problems in my life. Believe it or not, even in this very moment, you might, ha you might be having the worst time of your life, but there are some good things going on in your life as well. And being able to recognize those is what helps us get through a lot of these tough situations. The last one is, and I'm going to try and say it correctly because I practice it like 50 times. Uh, no, really, try and say it without me saying it. Oh my gosh, you guys are way smarter than me. <laughs> yeah, catastrophizing, dang, okay. Whatever, I told you, you guys make me feel so insecure. Uh, <laughs> uh, I told Bob this week when I said it, I was like, I, you know what, English was my second language, so give me some grace here. Uh, <laughs> um, but this is blowing things out of proportion and assuming the worst case scenario. And so this is typically when we get into fatalistic thinking. These are the five C's of negative thinking, and this is what we'll typically do if we're getting stuck in these kind of thought patterns. Now, we're told, just change your thoughts. Just change every single thought that you have. Can I tell you that's so much harder than it sounds? Because every single time that I feel insecure and I have to like sit there and focus on getting that to change, it's hard because the same mind that created the, ne ne the negative thought, I'm trusting that same mind to think of the positive thought. And it's very difficult. Do you know how uh, people recognize counterfeit bills when they're trained to, to, tra to uh, learn how to spot a counterfeit bill? is actually not by studying every counterfeit out there, but instead by studying the real bill as much as possible, to the greatest extent as possible. That way they can always tell that something's off when it doesn't look or feel like the real bill. I believe here in this same practice lies how to fight a lot of our thoughts. How do we fight lies and negative thinking? We study what's actually true. We study what's actually true. And we have to be prepared for when negative thoughts come at us. Because believe it or not, if you've already overcome some negative thoughts in your mind, they're not going to stop coming. They're going to keep coming. And we've got to be ready for it. And I believe that God wants to help you with this battle against some of these negative thoughts. There's a verse in scripture that I, I want to read. This is by a, a follower of Jesus is talking about scripture. And he says this, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is what I, I want to focus on today is the correcting bit because a lot of it is correcting our negative thoughts 
correcting these thoughts that affect us in a way that they push us down, they beat us down, and they kick us when we're down. And believe it or not, this is what's really cool. The end of that says, so that you may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I believe that when you get control of your negative thoughts, when I get control of my negative thoughts, it will affect the people around you. It will help the people around you. It'll help your family. It'll help your kids. It'll help your friends and your community. Because a lot of the time, our community is part of the biggest influence that we have. So we want to we wanna battle these thoughts. How do we battle these thoughts? Well, for this, I, I found a, a, a story of an old monk. It's an old Christian monk back in like the fourth century. Okay, and he saw the fact that he read like a passage of scripture where it said that Jesus went out into the wilderness to battle a lot of his thoughts and, and battle what he would call the enemy. And so he said, I'm gonna go do the same thing. So this monk goes out there in the beating sun in, in just wilderness for, for such a long time and finally comes out and everybody hears about it. And suddenly he has such a great insight into how to battle these negative thoughts. And a friend asked him, hey, what's your strategy? What do, you, what do I do to, to gain what you've gained? And so he's like, okay, I'll tell you. And this was his biggest claim. He said this, our battle in prayer, our battle inside of our minds and inside of our thoughts is this, is a battle against lies. It's a battle against lies things that are not true that come into our heads, things that will beat us down, things that will tear us down, and they're just simply not true. Can I tell you, if you've battled with insecurity, if you've battled with negative thinking, if you've battled with anything that has torn you down, you're not the first. It's not a recent issue. This has been an issue for a long time. This is something that we as humanity struggle with. You're not alone. He also said this, he, thought, he, he, he believes this. He believes that thoughts had a life of their own. They actually had intention. And so to him, he said, I, I think that the thoughts that go on in our heads, they are wanting to destroy us. Now, I don't know what background you have in faith. I don't know what background you have in spirituality. Um, but can I tell you, there is something out there that is actually trying to destroy you, that is trying to battle you. In Christianity, we call it the enemy, but you might believe it to be something else. Can we just use my terminology for now and call it the enemy? The enemy wants to attack you. The enemy wants to destroy you. And too many times we think that the way that the enemy attacks us is by draining my bank account. Or sometimes we think by, by ruining my car or by ruining my marriage. I don't think he has that much power over your life. I really don't. But I think what he might be doing is allowing you to have thoughts that aren't true, things that will influence you. You see, your bank account isn't drained because he magically went in and pulled money out, but instead because he was able to influence your thoughts and your spending habits. And eventually your bank account drained. See, he didn't go in and, and try to kill your marriage by just appearing and, and being somebody for your spouse to leave with. No, instead, what he did was is every single interaction, he started letting you both believe lies, things that weren't true about each other. You know, killing communication. The greatest victory he can have on you is destruction at your own hands. And this is a dangerous place to be, but this is what God desires for you. God desires for you to hold on to truth. He wants to breathe life into you. He wants to breathe life into your marriage. He wants to breathe life into your kids. He wants to breathe life into your business. He wants to breathe life into every aspect of your life. God gave us all that we need through scripture. Because he said, I want to give you thoughts to meditate about. Things that will help you overcome all of this. It, but it's not enough to have a gift. How many people have a physical Bible? How many, how many people have a physical Bible? Oh my gosh. 
Let's go, Cal Church. Um, how many people have uh, like the Apple Bible is what I call it, um, unless you have a Samsung, I guess. Uh, it's okay if you have a Samsung. Um, and <laughs> you know my bias all of a sudden. Um, but this, this is a great tool that we all have. This is an amazing tool we all have. But it's only valuable, a gift is only as valuable as when you open it. When you open it and you utilize it and it does what it was meant to do. So how do we battle lies? How do we battle negative thinking? We, we have to replace them with truth. So I wanna give you some practical steps on how to replace it with truth and how to implement scripture reading into your life. Now, I just recently started going to the gym, okay? I know it doesn't look like it, but I did. And I, I, I just got into my 30s and, you know, I started having all the 30s issues, you know, a few back issues. Uh, you know, my, my pants stopped fitting a little bit and, you know, my, my legs ache and, you know, I'm, I'm like, it, it's getting to me. And I'm like, okay, cool. I woke up one day and I was like, that's it. Okay, my life's over. And my wife was like, stop, you're, you're fine. I'm like, it's easy for you to say you're still in your 20s. Um, so... Uh, but I, I started going like, you know what? I need to take this seriously. So I started, I started getting a, a trainer. Um, I did a cheap, a cheap trainer. I did one online because I couldn't afford an actual one. Um, but I did, I did the ones that, you know, you got online and they give you like a plan. And I've learned a lot through working out because I, I'll tell you what, uh, Karen, I'm so sorry. I'm not the person you want to take to the gym, okay? I, I'm, I'm the worst person to go to the gym. I look at everything and I get overwhelmed. I have no idea what to do. Everybody's staring at me. I know they're not, but I feel like they are. And so it's, it's just one of those things. But I've learned a lot about going to the gym. And you know what I found out is a lot of the same things you have to implement when you, put in, when you implement any practice. And for, for this, I think there's a lot, of same, uh, a lot of the same tools in going to the gym as there is in scripture reading. One of them is this, you have to schedule it. You have to schedule it. You have to make sure you go, okay? Uh, I got Marlon over here, goes to the gym every morning, right? Every morning. And, I, and this, is, this is part of what we need to do, is we need to create a rhythm of Bible reading. Schedule it. Make sure it's part of your everyday schedule. The second thing is, just like I said, every morning, make it consistent. Make it consistent. You've got to make it consistent. You see, one thing that's interesting about our brains is once we do something enough times and it becomes habitual, we naturally go to it. This is what making it consistent will do for us. The third one, this one's the one I learned from the gym, okay? When I go into the gym and I look at everything there, I need to know what I'm gonna do first or else I'm gonna aimlessly walk around trying to find the first machine that's available. What you need to do is you need to make sure you have a plan. You have a plan. What am I going to read today? What am I going to read tomorrow? What am I going to read the next day? Pastor Brad is, is challenging us to go through a Bible reading plan. And if you don't know about that, go back and listen to his message from New Year's. It was a great message. And he's, he's talking about creating this kind of plan. Have a plan. Adopt the church plan or find a plan of your own, but just have one. The next one is this. Highlight and record scripture that means a lot to you. Highlight and record scripture that means a lot to you. This one is going to be really important in a minute, okay? But make sure if you find something, you're like, oh my gosh, that speaks to me. That's not the last time that's going to speak to you. And so make sure that you highlight it. Uh, this is just, I'm going to give you my cheat codes, all right? You guys ready for some cheat codes on reading the Bible? These are, hey, I don't think I can start with just reading the Bible. That feels a little overwhelming for me. Maybe I want to start a little differently. Well, I found some creative ways. One of them is, and I kid you not, me and Bria actually do this on days that I just don't want to read. Um, and yes, as a pastor, there are days that I just don't want to read my Bible. And that's probably horrible to say, but hey, no perfect people, right? Um, sometimes we just turn on The Chosen. This is an amazing TV show that goes through the story of Jesus. And I actually put the link on your little papers uh, for The Chosen. This is an amazing, uh, well-produced movie or not movie, a TV show that is actually still going on. Season four is about to hit. Um, and I'm telling you, it's such a great way to take in who Jesus is in a very tangible way. Another one is through worship music. 
Worship music. Did you know this? Most worship music is actually a lot, is based on a lot of scripture and is actually us just singing a whole lot of scripture. And sometimes it's the easiest way to learn. Actually, a lot of our older scripture was made in a rhythmic way, in a poetic way, so that we could remember it. And so I just go to, to worship music at times. And sometimes I just press the button and have the Bible be read to me. Uh, audiobook, the Bible. You can actually do it on the Bible app, and it's great. Um, if we have any Audible fans, there is an Audible, and it's free in the Bible. The next thing is this. Seek to understand the Bible. Seek to understand it. So one of them is rewatch Pastor Brad's message. He talks about, and you could go to calchurch.com, he talks about the SOAP method of how to read the Bible. And it's great. Another one is uh, something called the Bible Project. This is an incredible, like they've got illustrations and it looks like a kid's thing, but trust me, it's so deep and so, so nice to just have somebody tell you about the history of scripture. And they make it seem like a story and it's incredible. And so, uh, the Bible Project is such a great way to just understand and, buy, and get deeper into the Bible. The next one, shameless plug again, Bible study or life group. We have life groups starting up in February 4th, and this is an amazing opportunity to study the Bible in community. These are different ways. These are tangible ways to take steps toward Bible reading and making it part of our rhythm. And a quick disclosure, um, if you want, like, if you're going to get deeper into the Bible and you go in and Google, um, just be weary and careful with Google, because sometimes it, it comes down to whoever paid the most gets on the top uh, searches. And so make sure that you do a little bit of research outside of just a Google search. Um, maybe look at some of these things beforehand and check out what, what you can find out about the Bible. Now, when it comes to lies, here we go. Ready? When lies come to you, we already talked about these practical steps. Remember those highlighted verses? Take those highlighted verses and refer back to them when you're in a situation that they were talking about. Refer back to them when you're going through anxiety. Refer back to them when you're having struggles. Refer back to them where, when you feel like your marriage is falling apart or your kids aren't doing well or your job is falling apart. Refer back to them and see what God says about you. You know what God says about you? He says that you are enough. He says that he's enough, therefore you're enough. He says that you are deserving. He says he loves you and he cares for you and he's done so much for you to have security in that. Go through uh, Bible reading plans about insecurity, shame, guilt, whatever you're going through. And lastly is this, I actually love this one. There's a book in the Bible called Psalms. And this is a guy literally going through the deepest moments of life and just talking about them and having doubts about God and questioning God and questioning things. This is so great for people who are trying to figure out God a little bit more and figuring out somebody that actually followed God very diligently, but still lived an imperfect life. What does this do for us? It corrects our thinking. It does something for us. It makes sure that we can replace some of these negative thoughts with thoughts that are actually true. The purpose, the purpose of scripture is to bring truth into our life. It's meant to recalibrate our negative thinking toward things that bring us life. And believe it or not, this is something I found out. A research has actually concluded that there's a release of dopamine that goes into your brain. When you, uh, when you release scripture and it actually comes, it actually uh, develops overall healthier habits. Um, so, you know, if you need to, if you need to replace uh, a lot of bad habits and a lot of things that give you dopamine, reading scripture, best drug you could get. Seriously, it's like dopamine hits. It's awesome. It reminds us to look more at Jesus than ourselves when problems arise. This is huge. Because every time that we feel like our situations are way too big, guess what? They're not too big for Jesus. They're not too big for God. I'll, I'll conclude with this story. There's, I don't know if you know about the Chronicles of Narnia, but it's an amazing book. If you haven't read it, please go, go back and read it. It's incredible. And it's allegorical toward Jesus. It's allegorical toward who he was. 
And it tells the story of this lion called Aslan. He's supposed to be Jesus in this story. And in one of the books, the kids that, that come into Narnia, that go into this mystical place called Narnia, they, uh, they're looking for Aslan and they can't find him. And the youngest one named Lucy finally finds him. Now, she hasn't seen him in years, but she finally sees Aslan. And she's so excited to see him. And, and she, she makes this statement. She's like, you've gotten bigger. And he says, no, as you get older, I will appear bigger to you. This was actually a very deep statement from C.S. Lewis, the writer. What he was saying was every year she grew, Aslan appeared bigger because every year that she has bigger problems, she finds out that Aslan is still enough, that Jesus is still enough, that he didn't cap out or max out with the last issue you had. He didn't max out when he, when he had to help you save certain situations in your life that felt unsavable. He actually is way more powerful than that. As our problems get bigger, we find out just how big God is. Can I tell you he's big enough for your situation even right now? Our thoughts will keep attacking us, but our God has promised that he will always be enough for whatever we face. And because he is enough, we are. So I, I would encourage you, add this rhythm of scripture reading to your life. See how it changes your thoughts. See how it changes your, your interactions and your choices. It will change everything if you let it. And in turn, we lean more into God. And when we lean more into God, we see our entire lives change. We lean more into his words. We can take on anything. So I'll, I'll encourage you to do this. I'm, I'm serious. Sign up for life groups. Sign up for life groups this season. Here's a card in front of you, blue and, and yellow card, or a uh, blue and orange card. Could you pick that up real quick? Just pick it up real quick. Don't worry, you don't have to do what I'm about to, do, I'm about to ask you to do. Just pick it up to make me feel better. Pick it up. If you have not been a part of a life group and you're interested in being a part of a life group, they're gonna do offering buckets at the end. Would you write down your name and put on the bottom life group and put some kind of contact information, either phone number or email, one of the two, that way we can contact you. Um, uh, Karen Johnson, um, our life group's pastor, will take those all in and she'll contact you guys and make sure that everybody gets plugged into a life group. But we wanna see you be a part of one and go through scripture with people there's a huge power in community. And I believe that even this first step will start to change your life. Now I'm gonna pray and we're gonna end and I've got a couple things. Actually, please stick around for, for just a minute um, because I, I think you'll really be uh, happy you did. A uh, couple of announcements and then we've got uh, uh, the popcorn buckets coming forward. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for being in this room right now, for giving us the gift of scripture. And Lord, I just ask that as we implement this into, your, into our lives, that your Holy Spirit would, all, would already start working in our minds and take away all the negative thoughts that have been attacking us. Lord, I just believe in your power and I believe that you wanna free people from negative thinking this week. Lord, I ask you to do that. I ask for the person in this room that came in and is wondering, how do I get rid of all of this? Lord, that you would touch them right now that you would touch them right now. It's in your name we pray. Amen.